And so Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, the word of God says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many, somebody say many, many. who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. The New Living Translation says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. It is a choice. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. The Bible never declares that being a Christian and walking with God would be easy. However, it does reveal that it is the best decision that one could make. The benefits of saying yes to God is amazing. Unfortunately, many never find out because they refuse to say yes to the way. If you go and you read the book of Acts, when you talked about Christianity, it was, refer it was first referred to as the way. And there are many people still today that refuse to say yes to the way. They refuse to say yes to God. They refuse to say yes to Jesus. They refuse to say, yes, I need to be saved. And so people in general, let's be for real, people in general prefer the easy way in anything. That's how we are as a people. We don't want to deal with anything difficult, anything that's hard. We want to really avoid it. Amen? And so people in general prefer the easy way. Let me give you some examples. Some natural examples that you can probably relate to. People want the easy way when it comes down to eating. They either prefer to eat fast food or somebody else's food that somebody else prepared than to cook it themselves. Can we just be for real? See, see, you know, it's difficult when you have to stand there and prepare and cut up your vegetables and your onions and things of that nature, get your meat ready, season it, and all that other stuff that you have to do. That takes work. And a lot of people don't want to do work. Let me just pull up to the, we don't even want to get out of the car nowadays because we want it easy. Let me pull up to the drive through window and order me something that I don't have to put any work in. All I got to do is open my mouth and eat it. When you think about it, we prefer the easy way. When you think about it, guess what? Today, we want a diet pill instead of working out. Let's be for real. Anything that may let us believe that we can lose weight without actually putting in the work, we're willing to try. Popping pills and some. When for real, it's hard work to exercise. It takes a lot of discipline to exercise. But we are the type that if I can get a B12 shot in the work, come on now. People were on B12 shots for a minute. If I can get a B12 shot and it'll work, if I can take a super pill and it's going to work and I don't have to get on the treadmill, walk out and lift weights or do anything else, that's what I want. Because we want the easy way. When I think about it, I mean, you know, I may step on some toes today, huh? hallelujah, just because there's a whole bunch of women in here. But as women, we want the easy way. We want a wig or a weave. We ain't trying to do the hard work that it takes to keep our hair in order. And so sometimes it is so quick just to go and get one off the stand in the store, put it on, and keep on rolling. But we want the easy way. It takes a lot to maintain your own hair. When you think about it, we want the easy way. We would rather fornicate than to wait until we get married. See, it takes a lot of hard work to save yourself until marriage. So we want the easy way. Let's just do it when, it feel, when we feel like it. We want the easy way. When you think about it, the easy way. Living ungodly is easy. We want to do that instead of living holy. Because a lot of stuff that is required of us, we don't want to do. And some people simply aren't willing to do what's necessary to become Christ-like. So they refuse to walk all together and choose the wide road which leads to hell. How many of y'all know that is a choice? People are not in hell by 
mistake. They choose where they're going to go based on what they accept while here on earth. You accept the Lord as your Savior, the word lets you know that your destiny will be to reign and rule with God forever and ever. But if you choose to say no to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the word lets us know that your destiny will be hell. And how many of y'all know you can minister to, pe minister, to, minister that to people and they will still say, I don't want your Jesus. Mm -hmm. right. mm. Yeah, heaven may be real, hell may be real, but I don't want the Lord that you're serving. And half the time, it's because of what is expected of us as believers. We don't want to change. We want to stay the way we are. And so when you say yes to Christ, there are some things that you must expect. It's not always going to be easy, but it's going to be all right. But there are some things that you must expect. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. First of all, something that you must expect when you say yes to Christ is the fact that everybody isn't going to like you. It's just as simple as that. If you suffer with being a people person, it's going to be hard for you to walk this walk with God because you're so busy trying to please everybody else and you're not thinking about the one that you really should please. And so everyone isn't going to like you when you say yes to Christ. John chapter 15, starting at verse 18, is what I want us to look at on this morning. John chapter 15, starting at verse 18. And the word of God says, if the world hates you, if you read it in your Bible and it's written in red, it lets you know that Jesus is speaking. Yeah. And so right here, Jesus is speaking and he says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Yeah. See, because for real, we get caught up in thinking it's about us. It ain't about us. They hated him first. We just connected to him. But he says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, then the world would love its own. And that's the truth. If you part of the world, if you're in the world and you love the world, oh, guess what? They will receive you gladly. But as soon as you make a decision to stand for Christ, they have an issue with you. And so it says, yet because you are not of the world, because you made a decision to go down the narrow path, because you made a decision to walk that hard walk, to take that journey that many don't find, it says, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We have to understand that that is something that we must expect when we say yes to Christ. It says, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. So he said, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. He's saying, basically, I am the Christ. They had issues with me. Yeah. They persecuted me. So trust and believe they're going to do the same to you. Mm. It says, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all of these things they will do to you for my name's sake. Sometimes you're simply going to be hated on because of your association with Jesus Christ. People may like you when they first come in contact with you, not knowing much about you. But as soon as you reveal that you are a child of the Most High God, there are some people that may begin to treat you a little different. Expect it. But I, I encourage you, even though you already know that that's going to take place, because Jesus forewarned us in his word, we know it's going to take place. We know people are not going to like us. We know they're going to hate on us because of him. But I encourage you on today, do not be ashamed or hide whose you are because of the rejection that you may experience. Sometimes individuals want to hide the fact that they are a believer because of how they think others are going to treat them. Don't do that. Just understand that it's going to take place, but embrace who you are. Embrace whose you are, and never be ashamed to say, I am a child of the Most High God. All right, man. When you think about it, something else that you will expect or something else when you say yes to Christ that you need to know will take place. You will go through trials, amen, yeah. and you will be tempted. 
Please understand, salvation didn't give you an exempt status. Amen? People that are not in God go through trials, and people that are in God go through trials. People that are not of God are tempted, and people of God are also tempted. So don't think that salvation gave you an exempt status. But it does, however, equip you with what you need to go through a trial. See, one thing about it, we know just like every storm that comes, every storm has a what? Beginning and an end. Yeah. And there are some storms, if you're out there on the road, amen, let's just say it's a very bad thunderstorm. You're out there driving in your car. Your destination is to get home. Guess what? You have just left work. You have to drive through that storm in order to make it through your, to your destination. However, in the midst of driving through that storm, there are some things that we know that we need to apply. Slow down. Now, proceed with caution. Put on your windshield wipers. You know, sometimes you may have to put on your light so that you are able to be seen by others. And so when you think about it, God will give you what you need to go through a storm. Because you're going to make it out on the other side, amen, if you don't quit, if you don't faint, amen. And so he gives us what we need to go through a trial, to go through a storm. And he also tells us in his word what we need to do when we're tempted. Temptation comes to all of us, but his word gives us instructions as to what we need to do when we're tempted. Some passages say flee. Go the opposite direction. Ain't no need in walking towards temptation because you can't handle it. Uh, can a man take fire into his bosom and not get burned? No. So sometimes the word tells you flee. Sometimes the word lets you know straight up that I have provided a way of escape for you. Take it. It's there. But it's up for you to take it. And so, when you think about it, trials and temptations, both are a part of life for the saved and the unsaved. When you think about it, trials actually serve a purpose. We don't like to go through them. They're hard. You know, we may shed some tears in the midst of it, but trials actually serve a purpose in the life of a believer. Romans chapter 5 says, we can rejoice to when we run into problems. And that we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. So we know that they help us develop endurance. Some of us have been weak punks in the world. Can I just keep it real? Now that you have enlisted in the army of the Lord, you need to learn how to, my favorite word, man up. You got to learn how to be able to endure some stuff. So the trials that actually come your way, they're there to help you to endure, to build some character. And so it says they help us to develop endurance. And endurance helps develop strength of character. God's trying to make you a better person. He's trying to help you to get the characteristics of Christ. So sometimes he got to allow you to go through some trials and tribulations so that you can see what you still got problems in or areas you still got problems in. Because he's trying to develop your character. And so endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And we have to know that when we endure temptations, how many of y'all know God is pleased? When you're faced with different things that he knows is pulling on your flesh. When he knows without a shadow of a doubt, this right here I really want to do. And I really know it goes against God's word. When you say no to that and yes to him, God is pleased. Amen. God is pleased and the devil is defeated. At that moment, he don't have the victory in your life in that area. And so the devil is defeated. And guess what? We will be rewarded. Please understand, when you fight your flesh, when you die to yourself daily, there are things that you, as a child of God, you will receive. The word says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. See, when you think about it, again, I always say, if you really love somebody, it's going to be evident in the things that you do. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments despite the temptation that may come your way. And so it says, you will receive the crown of life when you endure temptation for those who he has promised, for those who love him. And so it is your love for God that will motivate you as a child of God 
to refuse to give in to temptation. See, when, you know, half of us loving ourselves a little bit too much, more than we're loving God, I was there, guilty, because I love some other stuff a little more than I really love God. Even though my lips were saying one thing, my actions were showing another. But it wasn't until I flipped the script and stopped loving that thing more than loving God. And once I started loving God more, guess what? That thing no longer had power and control over me. Because when you love him, it's going to motivate you to do what you know is right. You want to please him and not yourself. It really does get to a place in a person's Christian walk where you grasp the understanding that it ain't about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about all my desires and things of that nature. God, what do you want? What would you have me to do? And when you fall in love with God like that, your life changes for real. Your actions begin to line up for real. When you really fall in love with God. Something else that you would experience when you say yes to God is you will suffer for God's glory. It's going to happen. It's written in the word of God. The word of God lets us know, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That alone should get you excited to let you know this right here that I'm going through, this ain't nothing compared to what's going to happen, what's going to take place. Amen. And when you think about it, even though we know the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, we also have a greater understanding that suffering, even though we don't like it, the word of God tells us, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. So guess what? I may go through some stuff. But I know in the long run, it's all going to work together for the good. Some stuff that you're going through is simply to bring a testimony in your life so that you can help somebody else. Because trust and believe, you are not the only one that's going through the stuff that you're going through. But somebody needs a person that's real and transparent to say, I've been there, but look at me now. Now you say, how God got me through. And so sometimes your stuff ain't even about you. God is preparing you to help somebody else. He is preparing you to reach somebody else that's struggling, that feels like that there is no hope. He will use your life to help others all to bring him glory. And so when you think about what does it mean to suffer, the word suffer means to experience something unpleasant. Right then and there, mm -mm, we don't want this. Sister Rara knows all about this. That's one of her things. You know, I just don't want to suffer. Well, baby, you're going to suffer. Uh, you didn't already say yes, expect it. Amen? Amen? And so when you think about it, to suffer means to experience something that is unpleasant. It means to submit, to endure. I like that definition. Because guess what? If I'm going to suffer, God, I'm letting you know I submit to endure all that I got to go through as a child of God. To suffer means to experience pain. Illness or injury during the first Peter. First Peter chapter four. That's in the New Testament. Amen. Towards the read of your Bible. First Peter chapter four. And we're going to look at verse 12 through 19. First Peter chapter four, verse 12 through 19. And we're still talking about this suffering for God's glory. It's something that you can expect when you say yes to God. Verse 12, it says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Don't trip. Don't think it's strange because the word of God is already that you know it's coming to try you. Don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. You're not unique. It happens to all of us. We just need to know how to handle it when it does. Verse 13, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, 
blessed are you. Amen. For the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Because sometimes we're suffering, and it has nothing to do with lining up with the sufferings of Christ. We're suffering because of our own actions, because of our own choices. He said, that ain't the type of suffering that I'm telling you to rejoice about. It goes on to say, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come, say has come, come. for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. We serve a faithful God who can be with us when we go through these sufferings. And sometimes when you know that the sufferings are because of your connection with Christ, there are some things that are not as extensive as they could be. Amen? And so when you think about it, suffering for God's glory is different, as I said before, than from suffering because of foolish decisions you have made. That's called reaping what you sow. That's reaping what you sow because you made some foolish decisions. Now you're dealing with some stuff, and now you want to say you're suffering for the glory of God. No, you ain't. You're suffering for those decisions that you have made that totally went against the will of God. Again, as Christians, we sometimes suffer because of our association with Christ. People will simply talk about us, come against us, cause us pain, you know, call us out our name, tease us for our beliefs and things of that nature, and that stuff hurts. If somebody says that it doesn't hurt, I don't know what you're made of, but the reality of it is when you know that you're standing for a good God, you're serving a good God, and people want to come against you just for wanting to do his will, that can bother you sometimes. But you got to keep on moving. You got to know it's all for his glory. And so we may suffer when we choose to stand for righteousness. But don't ever refuse to stand because you know you may suffer. When you say yes to Christ, everything isn't negative, some of the stuff that you experience. I mean, I may have talked about trials. I may have talked about temptations. I may have talked about people hating on you. And I may have talked about suffering. But how many of y'all know there are a lot of positive things that come with saying yes to Christ too? Amen. When you think about it, when you say yes to Christ, you experience peace. My God. Woo, my God. When you think about it, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. That peace, it will guard your heart. That peace, it will guard your minds when you experience those trials, when you go through that hatred, when you go through that suffering. He will give you a peace to be able to endure like none other. People won't even be able to understand why do you have so much peace when you're going through all the things that you're going through. We understand we have peace because we know what Jesus said. He said, peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you. Not as the world, but I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. A lot of times you can see stuff going on in the world, and you don't have to be afraid. Because you know what? I got the peace of God. I have the peace of God that even if a hurricane, you got to be able to think like this, because we know tsunamis, they come and they destroy places, hurricanes and tornadoes, they come through and they wipe out people's homes, people lose their lives. As a child of God, you don't need to have fear. You need to have peace even in the midst of it. Because one thing you know, if you say yes to Jesus, if a tornado came and took out your house and took your life, guess what? You should have peace in knowing that I'm going to be with the Father. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we already know that being with him is far better than being here on earth. I mean, let's be for real. We got a work to do, but it's a mess here on earth. Satan is the God of this world, and he is reaping destruction everywhere. And it is increasing. But you got to be able to still have peace that, guess what? Even if that was to take place, I got peace. 
Even if my home was destroyed in the midst of it and I lost everything, I still got peace. Because somebody can say, but I still got my life at that moment. All the other stuff can be replaced, but I still got my life. You got to be able to say no matter what's going on, you have peace. What is peace? The inner tra tranquility and poise of the Christian whose trust is in God through Christ. When you really trust God, you can have a, like a woosah moment. Because, you know, I don't have what it takes to handle this on my own. I would lose my everlasting mind. Yes. But because I trust you, God, and because I depend on your word, it says to cast my cares upon you, you got this. Because yep. I can't handle it. He gives you that kind of peace. And when you think about it, operating in this type of peace is a witness to Jesus Christ. Because people can know the stuff that you're going through. They can see your life appearing to be falling apart. But in the midst of it, they see that you have a peace. And that makes them wonder, how in the world? The people who are in back of your house cutting off your electricity supply and you still singing praises to God. Your car just got repossessed, but you still singing praises to God. Because anybody know if you're used to having transportation and that transportation is gone, it's hard. You have to do a lot of adjusting. But the reality of it is in the midst of it, can you still glorify God? Because when you do, that speaks volumes about the God that you serve. And so when they see your life, when they know the stuff that you're actually going through and you still have peace, it makes them reach out sometimes. And say, well, tell me how to do this. Because when I go through, I don't respond like this. And that's your opportunity to share about the goodness of God. Yeah. When you say yes to Christ, how many of you know you may fall at times? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yes, you're saved, you're born again, but you're not Jesus. Yeah. He was the only one that was without sin. And so sometimes, even after saying yes to Christ, you will fall sometimes. But the word of God says the godly man may trip seven times, but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. See, we never read that part. All we know is the righteous man falls seven times, but he get back up. But we never think about the fact that it says, well, one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. Somebody in here needs to thank God for his grace. Yeah. You need to thank God for his mercy. Yeah. You need to thank God for his unconditional love. And you need to thank God for his forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. Because he could have treated you like the wicked. And one situation could have, bam, took you out. But you fell in your mess. And he had grace and mercy enough to say, okay, let me help you back up. Get back up. Let's do this thing again. We need to be thankful. And so when you think about it, his forgiveness is there. We got to understand that. We may fall, but his forgiveness is there. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If anybody here think, well, you know, I don't sin. I'm all right. I'm not in need of any forgiveness. The devil is a liar. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, yes, God, I messed up. Yes, I failed. Yes, I turned my back. Yes, I disobeyed what you told me to do. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's just like taking a Holy Ghost bath. You think about it, sometimes we walk in unrighteousness. We become so dirty, amen? And the Lord sees what's on us, but we say, God, I need your help. Just cleanse me. He just allows his spirit just to cleanse us. He allows his forgiving power to cleanse us. He allows his unconditional love to just cleanse us. Yeah. And then when you think about it, when you say yes to Christ, it is so important that you know who you are according to the word of God. Not according to what other people say. Because sometimes people want to put you in a box. Sometimes when you want to say yes to Christ, people want to hold on to who you were as the old man. But you need to know without a shadow of a doubt who you are and what God's word says about you. 
The word of God said lets us know that you are a chosen generation. Say chosen. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things become new. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. I'm not the same. I'm new. So, there's something else that you can expect when you say yes to Christ. When you say yes and walk in obedience. Turn to Deuteronomy 28. You, child of God, can expect to be blessed. Hallelujah. There are some promises that come with this thing. If I die myself, if I don't do what I want to do and what my flesh want to do, what do I get from this, God? When I die, when I come against disobedience, when I walk in obedience, is there anything that I am going to experience, not just in heaven, but here on earth? He said, those that hate their mother, their brother, their sister, those that give up all of these things on earth, not only will you be blessed in heaven, but you will also be blessed here on earth. And so you better know, child of God, and I said two parts to this. It's not just about saying, yes, I accept you, Jesus, but it's about saying, yes, and I obey. Because when you obey, expect to be blessed. Deuteronomy 28, it says, now we shall come to pass. If, if, if. Yeah. That let you know you have to do your part, if. Because if you don't do these things, then guess what? You won't receive these things. But if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God, you know when he's speaking. You hear his voice. His spirit lives down on the inside of you. You can open up his word and he speaks to you on a consistent basis. And so it says, if you obey the voice of the Lord, your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord, your God, will set you high above the nations of the earth. And all these blessings, say all these blessings, shall come upon you and overtake you. Oh my God. I don't know about you, but I want to be overtaken with blessings. Amen. I think about how it talks about how the windows of heaven, you know, will be open and pour out a blessing that you can't even contain. I just want so much that I just got to give stuff away. I just want to be blessed, oh God, that even when I just walk by them, amen, that these are able to feel the presence and the anointing of God and their life is changed. I think about Paul with the handkerchiefs. When you think about people that were suffering, they were going through things, they would take the handkerchiefs from Paul's body and send them to others, and people's demons were cast out and people was healed from the sick. I don't know about you, but I want all of the blessings from God that I can receive. And I ain't talking about just materialistic things. Bless me spiritually. Oh, bless me mentally. Bless me even in the physical sense. Financially, do whatever you need to do, because I'm not going to turn down for nothing. Everybody want to talk about turning down for what? I ain't turning down for nothing when it comes down to the blessings of God. And so when you think about verse 2, it says, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. Why? Because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flock. Blessed shall be your baskets and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated. I don't know about you, but I don't have to fight my battles, because the Lord lets me know the battle is not yours, but the Lord's, amen, and when you're blessed and walking in obedience, it says the Lord will cause your enemies to rise against you, to be defeated before your face, they shall come out against you one way and flee before you, how many times? Seven ways, the Lord will command the blessings on you, in your storehouses, and all to which you set your hand, he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you, the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you, if, say if, if. 
You keep the commandments of the Lord, your God, and walk in his ways. Then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant, grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the, in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. I think about the passage of scripture that minister folks read this morning. Psalm chapter 1. It talks about blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. It goes on to say that everything that he do will be blessed. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of living waters. This passage of scripture is letting us know that there are so many things that we can't even imagine that will come to us by us simply obeying the voice of the Lord. Verse 12, the Lord will open to you his good treasure the heavens, to give to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. How many of y'all tired of borrowing? How many of y'all tired of being broke? He said, I will put you into a position where you will be able to help others, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath. If, say if. Yeah. You heed the commandments, the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them. Not just know them, but do them. So you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day to the right or to the left to go after other gods and serve them. I don't know about you, but I, as a child of God, expect to be blessed. When I say yes to the Lord, yes to his will, and no to myself, I expect to be blessed. I don't know anybody in their right mind that does not want to be blessed. And so there are so many other things that you can truly expect when you say yes to God. I just hit on a few of them this morning. Some beautiful experiences, no doubt. Amen? You can expect those when you say yes to God. You can expect victories when you say yes to God. You can expect rewards when you say yes to God. A life of joy and peace, despite the trials and tribulations that will come your way. We have a charge from God to reveal him to others, to seek and save the lost. Although there are many who will choose the wide gate that leads to hell, we need to let folks know that the narrow gate is the way to go. That's right. We need to let individuals know mm. that this is the path that you need to choose. Yes. So I encourage you to let your life reflect that the narrow gate, which isn't easy because it goes against our sin nature, let your life reflect that the narrow gate is worth all the sacrifices it takes to walk in that path. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Some will reject you. Turn to Luke chapter 14. This is our last passage of scripture. Luke chapter 14. And we're going to start at verse 14. But know that along this journey there will be some that will reject. And please understand, they're not rejecting you. Oftentimes we think people are rejecting us. No, they're rejecting Christ. And because Christ is in us, we have a tendency to take it personal. But they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Christ. And so some will reject, but still present it to them. Let them know that this is the path that they need to choose. And refuse to allow the rejection to stop you from doing what God is calling you to do. See, sometimes we don't want to be rejected, so we have a tendency to stop reaching out to others because of that fear of rejection. So I'm just not going to say anything. People don't want God today. I'm not going to say anything. No. You still need to share. And so some will reject, but don't let that stop you because some will say yes. How many of you know you eventually did? I mean, is there anybody that said yes when God was first presented to them? I mean, I don't know a whole bunch of people. I'm not going to say that's nobody's story. 
But oftentimes when people begin to talk about God to us, you need to be saved, born again, and you need Jesus and things of that nature, uh, we don't immediately say yes. Sometimes we say no. We say no a couple of times, amen? But eventually we say yes. So guess what? You have people that's going to say no, but you also going to have individuals that say yes, because you eventually said yes. And so let us do our job and compel the people to come. We don't compel the people to come into relationship with Christ. We don't compel the people to know that they need to be born again. We don't compel to people the people to know that this is the life that they need to lead. We get caught up in our own life. We do our own thing. We're like, I'm good. That's on them. But we need to compel them to come and let them know that a great supper has been prepared for them. Luke chapter 14, verse 15. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. I even think about, we just recently had our friends and family day. We did a lot to reach out to people. Praise God, we had a full house and People actually came. We put papers out and things of that nature. We don't believe anybody came as a result of that, but you did your part. The reality of it is that's what's important. Continue to do your part. Don't look at always the outcome immediately. Amen? Continue to do your part. And so it goes on to say, come for all things are now ready. You know? But but they are with one of they all, but they all with one accord. Begin to make excuses. Come on now, y'all know y'all probably reached out to some people and y'all probably got all kinds of excuses. Yeah. I'm just talking about inviting them, but when you, even when you talk to people about Jesus Christ, accepting the Lord as their Savior, people will come up with all kinds of excuses. And he said, I done prepared a great supper. Go and reach the people. So they went, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord begin to make excuses. The first said to him, well, you know, I bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see about it. I ask you to have me excused. Okay. Verse 19, and another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Okay. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Okay. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. And the master of the house being angry because it will upset you. It will upset you when you really are trying to tell somebody how much they need the Lord and they come up with all these excuses that don't mean nothing. Do you really? Okay, yeah, you got a wife. You loving on her right now. But if you don't accept Christ, do you know you're going to hell? You loving on your wife while you're here, but when you die, if you still refuse Christ, you're not going to be with God forever. You may have your oxen and you want to test them out. You test driving your car. You test driving your bike. You doing whatever you got to do. But the reality of it, that ain't going with you. Amen? And so if you're going to put all those things before God and you refuse to say yes to God, the reality of your destination ain't going to be the greatest. And sometimes when you hear this foolishness that comes out of the mouth of people, when it comes down to why they will not say yes to God, it will make you angry. Especially when they know heaven is real and they declare that heaven is real but they still say I ain't ready it will upset you but it's going to happen and so the master was angry and so the master of the house being angry said to a servant you know what we ain't got time for people with excuses excuses will get you excused and you have to feel the same way. I ain't got time for a whole bunch of people with a whole bunch of excuses. He said, you know what? Leave them alone. He said, go quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor. Bring in here the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded. And still there is room. Now that's the sad part. That there's still room. Because when I think about it, 
everybody ain't going to say yes. There's more than enough room in the kingdom of God for every single created being on this earth. It really should be to a place where, you know, how some places are standing room only. You can't even get no more because you're full at the capacity. But he said, I'm telling you, go. They don't want it. Go to the highways, the byways, get the lame, get the blind, get the mute, get whoever. And he said, I did it. But there's still room. One thing about it, as long as there's still room, we still got work to do. We still have people to reach. And so the master said to the servant, go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come that my house may be filled. God is coming back. Yes. Nobody knows the day nor the hour. He's not slack concerning his return, but he knows that there's still room in his house, in his family, for others. I just pray that we become so touched in our hearts and understand our purpose, which is the Great Commission. We have a responsibility to go and reach the laws. Compel them. Talk to them. You can't force anybody, because he's not talking about forcing. But oftentimes, y'all, we're really not doing our part. We're really not doing our part. You got to ask yourself, who have I witnessed to this year? Have I led anybody to Christ? Have I even presented Christ to anybody? Because so often we get caught up in our everyday life and we really forget why we're here. We are here to do work for God. He's prepared a great supper. Many are coming up with all kinds of excuses. But please don't let their excuses stop you from doing what God wants you to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. May God have a blessing to the word of God in today. I thank God. Some people just don't know what they do or 